Welcome, everyone. I'm Stephen Blackwood. I'm the president of Ralston College. And today I have the enormous pleasure to welcome Dr. Marwa Al Sabuni to our lecture series, our conversational series. Uh, Dr. Marwa Al Sabuni is an award winning architect and author and uh, an, inspired, an inspiring and inspired uh, survivor of the Syrian civil war. I think uh, Marwa. Dr. Al Sabuni is, is a prophet. She is a voice that speaks deeply and beautifully of what it is to be human, that reminds us of what a home is and can be in the deepest sense, that opens up a shared horizon uh, for each of us as, as human beings. And I am, uh, it's a great pleasure, Marwa, to welcome you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Stephen, uh, for having me, and thank you for such uh, kind words. Uh, I probably don't deserve uh, all of them or most of them. I hope I live up to to partly to to that. But uh, I'm really excited about today and uh, uh, for our conversation. Well, why don't we? I have had the 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 uh, just deeply moving experience of spending a good part of the last few weeks with your books, uh, Marwa. And, uh, but I don't want to assume that all of our, that all of our listeners uh, have, have also had the chance already to read both of your books, though I'm going to quickly introduce them here just so people have a clear view of what they are. Uh, Marwa's first book is A Battle for Home. It's a, it's a deeply moving memoir, uh, uh, sort of that picks up from the, the Syrian civil war and reflects uh, on that. And then her most recent book, which has really just been <clears throat> released in the last few weeks here in the United States, is Building for Hope. I hope you can all see those. I'd encourage you all to, to pick up uh, both of these books um, uh, and, read them, and read them together. Uh, I read them in the order in which they, they, were, they were written. Um, I really cannot recommend these uh, powerfully enough. One thing that really strikes me about Marwa's work is that though her context is very different than that which many of us have, have experienced, as, and certainly all of us who have not ha had to face the suffering of a civil war, somehow it's the dramatic difference of that context that cuts through the cuts through our assumptions and clarifies the fundamental questions. And, and I, what I really want above all for this conversation today is that our, our listeners both live here today and then after the fact on, on, uh, on the podcast, be able to witness and experience something of the, 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 the illumination and moving uh, story uh, uh, that is yours, Marwa. So I think really the best way for us to begin is just for to turn things over to you and you can in introduce yourself to us however you would like and take as much time as you'd like to do so. And then we'll, we'll I know you have a few images to share with us, but we'll, we'll have the, the, we'll let the conversation go as uh, uh, however the spirit moves. And uh, to the audience, I will simply say that you can shoot in questions on the chat anytime you like and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get to those during and after uh, the conversation that Marwa and I now have. So over to you, Dr. Marwa al Sabuni. Well, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm an architect, like you said, by training and uh, by chance, I turned into a writer as well. Uh, I live in Homs, uh, Syria, and I would like to give the audience uh, and our conversation uh, a bit of context through the images and uh, alongside the images, I'll be speaking about my city and the transformation that happened to, to my city. And afterwards we can, we can have uh, our conversation together. So I'll begin with, uh, with sharing my screen because I, I believe uh, who I am and what I do is, is very much related to where I'm, I'm based and where I come from. Uh, bear with me a bit because I'm not a pro in Zoom. Uh, do you see my 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 screen now? Is it? Yep. Can we, you see? Yeah. Okay. So this is the map of uh, of. Oh uh, no, we can't Hong see the image yet. Oh, there we are. Now we now we see it. Thank yeah. you, Marwa. Thank you. 
so Homs is uh, is uh, is the uh, is the third largest province uh, and city in, in in Syria, and it, it is located in the mid part of the country. And as you can see here from the map, uh, it is uh, it is surrounded by a countryside to the east and to, and to the west. And if I you could see my my mouse sign here, this is called New Homs, which is a new development near Homs. And this mid part is is the old city uh, uh, surrounded by few other uh, recent. Uh, neighborhoods, but all 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 the rest here is you could think of as informalities. So uh, more than fifty percent, actually fifty five percent of the city uh, is, uh, is um, known as uh, as an informal areas. Uh, it is historically known as the mother of black stone. So the black stone or the basalt uh, is the main. Uh, local stone which was used in traditional architecture of the city and it was all uh, it come they all come from a volcanic from the volcanic hill on which the uh, the city is, is built uh, there are beautiful sites surrounding the city uh, such as this lake near near homes as you can see, this is an overview before the, before uh, the war, and it's it's mostly a, a compact uh, mid-rise uh, um, block building, and it has it had the city has went through many transformations, uh, especially in a rapid way, especially in, in in the last few decades. So my father's generation and my grandfather's generation, uh, they witnessed the tra transformation to the de degree that. The, ch the city changed for them uh, in one lifetime many times. And this is applicable to all the cities in Syria, by the way. And this is also a, a, an overview of uh, what kind of building is there. And uh, I, would, uh, I would say that the importance of showing those images is, it, it is, is because I, in my work, I focus about uh, on the role of architecture in conflict. So I introduce architecture as 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 a primer uh, as as a prime uh, player in the recent conflict, which has been going on now for almost eleven years, uh, and I connect the way that the city transformed into uh, an, an area that was ready to, to ignite. The city is uh, is known for for the clock, uh, so this is called the clock. Uh, square is the old clock square, and uh, funny enough, as as many fa funny facts about the city that we have two tower clocks, and they are just you know few hundred meters away from each other. So this is the the new clock tower, uh, which is one street uh, away from the first, and between those two landmarks, uh, the whole city's uh, center is uh, is comprised. Um, the city is known for uh, uh, for the river. Uh, this is the canal. So the river goes uh, goes uh, uh, beside the city. It, it doesn't enter the city. the The irrigation canals are what bring what brought uh, the water uh, into the city historically, um, and it, it gives it uh, a, a pleasant sight and, and, and life. And was also historically part of the economic wheel uh, in, in the city. Uh, so those are the orchards, which are located to the west part of the city, and they are uh, the, um, the food store of the city. So the whole economic cycle uh, is located in those orchards, basically. It's, it's a very uh, fertile land where uh, people used uh, to to have crops and and and, and trade with with the surroundings, but now uh, as, uh, this is another transformation that uh, Stephen and I might touch upon uh, as part of understanding uh, the, in the the life of the city. Um, this is another this is another picture of of the. Uh, in the orchard. Uh, the weather in, in the city is quite mild. So we have uh, harsh winter and winters, but we have also lovely springs and, and nice summers. And it can be very windy in, in, in homes. So this is this is a shot from, from the countryside where you can see the frost 
all over uh, the trees and, and the cables of the electricity network. And uh, two uh, cultural landmarks uh, are uh, noticeable in, in, in around Homs is the Karak de Chapelle, the, the, the big crusaders, uh, Castle uh, in, in the western countryside, and also Palmyra to to the to the east. Uh, in terms of damages, uh, we can think of Homs as uh, as one of the most affected cities during the war because it was the first city to erupt in violence in in during the events of this war in 2011. And this map could give you uh, some estimation of the damages. Uh, if you could see here uh, from the key of the map, the 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 red the the dark red says heavily damaged. So those are completely destroyed areas. And partially damaged is uh, is the the lighter red. So it's it's um, either 50% damaged or 40% damaged. And the affected are just you know the the almost pink ones, which uh, which had had sustained few damages but not noticeable uh, as as the rest. But if you look at homes and you compare it with the map I showed you earlier, you would see that the whole city is affected by war. There is no single place that hasn't been affected. Uh, this is an overview from uh, from a drone image, and you could see complete neighborhoods destroyed and evacuated not a single soul uh, was uh, was living there after after the destruction and this could give you also uh, an image of what type of destruction are we talking about we are talking about pancaked uh, uh, buildings stripped away structures and uh, rubble all over and this is also another picture um, from from one of the neighborhoods, and this you could also compare with the overview that I showed you earlier of uh, of uh, um, also swaths of uh, of uh, land that has been completely destroyed. Uh, this is close to the center, and you could see here uh, the landmark uh, mark mosque, which is Khaled bin Walid Mosque, but. Again, here you can imagine the, the displacement and the movement that happened here and the size of the destruction that is uh, that is that has taken place. Uh, Homs, uh, this is an, an old picture that showed showed how the compact uh, old city uh, of Homs, which right was right in the center, how how uh, multi multi faith and multiple backgrounds lived uh, lived in very close proximity, just you know juxtaposed. You could see the Roman Catholic Church here, and here is the Orthodox Church, and here two mosques. In between, and um, the whole fabric here is just so compact. But then, but again, going back to the idea of transformation, you could see that it, it was pierced with new, uh, new buildings, new cement block building. Um, back to to the Khalid bin Walid Mosque. Um, as I mentioned, there are. It, it, this is one of the landmarks in the city that uh, you know it, it belongs to the consciousness of the cities because the city is called uh, uh, Al Walid City again uh, one of the of the names of the city Al Walid City uh, after the Khalid ibn Al Walid and another one is it uh, the Saint Mary Church which which I will be showing in a few slides and this is the mosque before destruction and you can see the interior I um, dedicate. Um, uh, some part of my first book, The Battle for Home, uh, um, examining the architecture of those places and speaking about uh, the simplicity and uh, the serenity uh, and the modesty as well that um, by which the city's architecture was known for. And um, this is the interior of the St. Mary Church, which is the oldest Orthodox uh, church uh, uh, in the world, basically, because it was built in 59 AD. Uh, and, and afterwards, 
what you see here is uh, the Byzantine building. So it was the the main church was built in 50, 59 AD, but then uh, in 1852 uh, a Byzantine structure was uh, was rebuilt uh, over the old church, and the old church is still uh, lying there in the basement untouched. And you can see the interior here built with the same building material as, as the mosque, which is the black basil that we, we saw in the first uh, slides. This is the, uh, the church from the outside, uh, sustaining damages, but luckily it was, uh, it was restored. So it doesn't look like this anymore. Uh, it, it has been restored to its uh, original state. Uh, but, in this image, you could see as well uh, the whole fabric of, of the old city, uh, again, transformed and with the mosque in the background and, and those buildings destroyed in the background as well. Uh, this is to show you how the Khalid Mirwali uh, sustained damages. And the whole surrounding area, which is called Al Khaldiya uh, after the mosque, uh, which is a very big neighborhood, is completely destroyed and hasn't been hasn't been reconstructed, or and people hasn't gone back to it. And this image shows us the the Roman Catholic Church from a different angle, uh, also sustaining some damages. Um, the mosque here is is in the background, and this image uh, also of the old market that uh, is another element uh, in the city's life and in the city's tradition, the traditional architecture uh, also uh, being destroyed, which has affected the city economically uh, very harshly. Um, I think this is, this is it for the overview. Uh, if I can stop share, sharing my screen and go back to you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Marwa, for that. Uh, that for for starting us off. Let me. You and I have had the chance to speak uh, several times over the last week, but just let me say uh, how how sorry I am to see the the devastation of your city and for the the unspeakable suffering uh, that you and your 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 fellow citizens have 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 undergone in these in these years. You. The, the the battle for home, in the battle for home, you you really make the argument that that though of course this terrible conflict had had many complicated uh, causes and and going back a, a many many years and that that that, an out, that analysis can be made of those causes from any number of different angles, you make a very bold and provocative argument that architecture played a, an important role in the in cultivating the conditions for this immense uh, human suffering, you you say in the book that the undoing of the urban fabric has advanced hand in hand with the undoing of the moral fabric. And in another moment, you write, and in our disintegrating society, architecture loses its way, just as people do, acquiring new blemishes in the name of renovation and losing the humble utility of an art form that should be devoted to settlement and unity. So I just I want to, <clears throat> to ask if you would if you would summarize in a way or at least open up something of the history, what went wrong in terms of architecture and urban and city planning in Homs that 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 opened the way for the the astounding devastation and death uh, of 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 the civil war. Um, so I traced this back in the book to to the colonial history of the city. I, I go back to the French mandate uh, in Syria, uh, and I I noticed uh, and I read in my research how the French uh, actually uh, used the expertise of an architect in order to transform the city and to control the city uh, and open way. To, to their own colonization in that sense. And uh, what was interesting for me is how we, after the independence as well, uh, as Syrians picked up on, on, on the same policies and, and we, 
kind of perpetuated those policies uh, in order to to just you know bec- become in, in order to keep those transformations happening to till the degree of explosion that we witnessed today uh, i i think the to understand how architecture played a role in, in, in this, in conflict, and how it could be also uh, uh, play a role uh, in, in peace as well. Uh, I think we should. Uh, I, sh- I think we should understand how, how the old city, the old Islamic city, for example, worked and functioned. I, and I think the importance uh, of of that architecture uh, lies in in four uh, in four uh, main elements. So uh, the first one is that uh, it was able to not uh, separate uh, the poor from the rich. So from the, the from the from the outside, from the exteriors uh, of buildings, you couldn't tell who was poor and who was rich. You couldn't tell from which class they came. And in that sense, you have you had this interwoven fabric. You had you had people living uh, door to door uh, f- uh, without separation, without segregation. In, in the second one is is uh, this the same way that happened between you know also different backgrounds and different faiths, like we saw we saw in the images. You had the Muslims and Christians living also as neighbors. You had the churches and mosques uh, built uh, also door to door and and side to side, and you could and, and could hear the calls for the prayer uh, alongside uh, with the bells to, uh, of the churches that call their worshippers into those places. In the same streets, they crossed the same street, they, they, they encountered each other, they greeted each other, they worked with each other. And again, that was another uh, area where people were able to cultivate this sense of neighborliness and, and, and sense of, uh, what do you call, coexistence. But I, I don't like the word because it, it was one existence, basically. And um, the third, uh, the third element is is that architecture wasn't about separating human human beings and, and and people from nature. So nature was was a key element in in in, in that architecture. It wasn't you know for decoration or for just you know uh, making a, a place just look pleasant. It was an integral part of the way people built. And uh, the fourth and final one is also religion. So people weren't uh, separated from uh, from their spiritual places. They 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 had no zones for you know uh, residential uh, and, uh, and residential zones and and you know a spiritual landmark and you know this kind of segregation uh, didn't happen. So you had this compact interwoven threads of. Uh, of architecture of fabric and urban fabric that reflected itself on the social fabric. And the transformations that I speak about were about unraveling this fabric one by one. So what what began with the French is calling on the rich to come out of the, the, the shameful Old city, so it becomes you know it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't good enough for them anymore to live there, and they built those uh, new areas, those push push areas where they lived, and then um, one by one, the unravel thread by thread, the, the unraveling continued. The Christians had their own quarters, and the Muslims had their own quarters, and and this segregation and this alienation. Uh, was reinforced as well with with the with the industrialization that happened in the 50s and the 60s. So uh, with the rural immigration towards the city, you had uh, the newcomers to the city living in in distinct neighborhoods, uh, living parallel lives to the life that was happening in, in in the city, and you had a mix, you know, of of bubbles, isolated and um, doesn't belong, doesn't have connection with each other, and doesn't have connection with the city. I don't want to make this, you know, any longer, but there are layers of, you know, exploring this more in the book and ha- how also the aesthetics of the architecture also is another element uh, into finding this sense of belonging and sense of home. I'd like to uh, just go back into into 
your summary and and dig a little deeper into a couple of the themes that you brought out. The the first is well, let's start with the aesthetic, which is where you finished. Um, <laughs> to, to contrast contrast the 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 different aesthetics, broadly speaking, and give a sense of of what you think is at stake in them. Um, could you could you just you know. Well, I just mean, I just, well, let me say you, you have some beautiful passages in your book where you, you speak about how certain kinds of design, both in terms of the city itself and in terms of particular buildings can cultivate a sense of generosity, a sense of stability and peace, a sense of belonging and home, whilst other kinds can be alienating and uh, uh, off-putting, can, uh, sh can deny us the denying the very sense of home that another form of architecture might might cultivate. Can you just say a, a few words about how you've you've observed this? Yes, I, I think this is more focused on in, in the second book in, in building for hope. So the, the question of how buildings makes us feel uh, is is become more of a focus for me in the second book because I I I basically uh, investigated the idea of of style and form and what makes one form of of building uh, more appealing than the other and uh, how how those buildings you know, could be reformative in in a way and uh, I th uh, I introduced the five fears in, in the book in 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 the shape of the five chapters of the book and those are the five in the fear of death and and and, and need treachery uh, loneliness and and uh, boredom uh, and i think of those fears as the scaffold that the whole book is 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 built on because they represent uh the the extreme that we do not wish to to confront uh, with our built environment, so uh, a building could make make us feel, uh, you know, make us feel disconnected, and we seek continuity. And in that sense, uh, we we find in in the past creations uh, this the, our 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 you know our continuity. Uh, because this is, you know, as, as I speak in the book, it, it, it represents a sense of accomplishment to us, and and this sense uh, counteracts, if you will, uh, the the fear of death or the fear uh, fear of our uh, mortality. And uh, again, when it's when it's need, when we are facing the fear of need, we are looking for generous places. We we are looking for places that could. In, Give us this sense of security, sense of settlement. We seek this, those feelings of safe and security in every way, in every aspect around us. And sometimes we find it in 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 a fruitful tree, and sometimes we find it in in uh, in a beautiful window frame or in a beautiful uh, work of of carpentry uh, on a door. So those embellishments that should not cross a line, of course. I, I speak in the book, I, I put an emphasis on balance, how you do not uh, move from one extreme to the other and how this balance is achieved in the cycle of, of, uh, of the, the social life of the city and the economic life of the city. So um, um, I, I think our buildings um, are, you know, are, are the, the, the stage for the whole process. There's so much in what you've said that I want to return to as we continue our discussion, Marwa, but if I can return to another theme that you brought out in your, your overview of the relation between the arch architecture and the conditions of the Civil War. Uh, you, you, you mentioned the how in, historically in Homs and perhaps in other, in Syria generally, there was a very wonderfully integrated uh, civic character, different religions, different classes, uh, uh, different beliefs. Uh, you, one of the most beautiful images you give in the book, which you've just referred back to 
in your in your in your comments a minute ago was that in in Homs you could sometimes actually hear the the Muslim call for prayer simultaneous with the with the Christian church bells you know happening at the same temporal moment hearing both of those in the ear at the same time and that's a just a beautiful uh, metaphor uh, I would say for for what would was obviously a uh, a very beautifully integrated city uh, in which there's a kind of shared, you, you speak, you write about this in the book about a kind of shared horizon or shared sense of the civic project of life together. And so uh, it, what, what were the architectural or city urban planning decisions that, that fractured that and led to uh, a much, uh, to a, to a cityscape in which the, the groups were divided by group rather than integrated in as a whole. Well, I part I partly ans answered that when I spoke about uh, the French policy, but two two actions you can change the city by which you know building and and destroying. So by demolishing certain parts, uh, and and basically what the municipality was doing that they were demolishing the old parts and building new parts. And there was no reason, no wisdom behind those, those acts. Uh, you demolish something that is completely, you know, sustainable and completely sound and, and beautiful and functioning in order to build something as an experiment. And it's 99% it's of the time. Uh, is failing, so it's it's not it's not functioning. It's ugly and it doesn't make any sense. It, it doesn't have any meaning. It doesn't incorporate any uh, wisdom and any character that was deployed in the life of the city. I, I could give more of a coherent example. For example, what was appealing in in the traditional architecture, and I hear the must emphasize that I'm not a traditionalist. I'm not, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't have nostalgic or romantic ideas about architecture, but I notice what has functioned in the past. And I notice also what is missing in, in the present. And, and I compare the two and try to find this bridge between the two. So what was functioning in, in, in the, the old part or the traditional architecture that it, it was using the first thing that it was using was using a local material, which is the black basil. You, you saw a whole mountain of it, and it was it was in 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 that process is it was using the local expertise and the local also uh, kind of love, you know, for this for this uh, natural element that you opened your eyes to uh, in a building. And you see the transformation of a raw material into a, a refined product. And you see it in, in, in the iron and in, in, in metal work and in, in the carpentry and in a whole series of other vocations that was, you know, become the, the vein of life in the city. And um, I mentioned in Building for Hope how whole neighborhoods were built around the idea of 40 vocations. So you have the core, the, the center is built around 40 vocations. That's why we have uh, in each city, a neighborhood called the neighborhood of the, of the 40. Those 40 vocations were, you know, the, the process of building. And in, in the process of building, you had incorporated the whole, the, the whole city basically. And this is a very strong connection to what you build and, you, and your sense of accomplishment and your sense of belonging, which we completely lost now, almost completely in our modern times, not only in Syria, but also globally. You have now uh, corporates and uh, factories that manufacture um, a whole building for you. It could 3D printing, 3D print uh, elements for you, and it could could give you um, a ready model for you to, to install and 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 to to have it as as a home. And with with this process, that was the product of the aftermath of the World War II. I think we eroded uh, a much needed uh, process of belonging.
want to ask you a little bit uh, about a few other things that uh, that came up in your introduction, Marwa. Um, you know, one thing that really has struck me in, in your work, you know, of course, I live in a very different uh, uh, a place with a different history. Um, and and here in the, in the United States, um, you know, there, there's no there's no immediate sense that uh, though there are a certain certain amount of civil, civil, civil unrest, you know, there's no immediate sense that uh, you know we could be on the edge of a of a civil war or something of that uh, on the on the scale of, of which you you have you have described. Um, and yet, I I read your book. I was just I found it comp- so gripping because what I I couldn't help but wonder uh, whether the as I was reflecting on the hyper-partisan uh, character of, of civic life in the West generally, certainly here in the United States, the sharpening of divisions, the, 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 the defining of the self as different from others, you know, rather than finding a shared horizon that can affirm those differences while also transcending them. I found myself thinking that it would be a mistake to think that here in the United States or elsewhere that those sharpening divisions uh, might not, if we don't find ways of addressing them, um, of unifying, of, 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 of cutting through to affirm and transcend those differences, uh, that, that they too could lead to ever degrading, uh, uh, to, to further degradations of our civic life and indeed uh, potentially you know, God forbid, to violence, and and so what I'm what I'm what I what I found so ringingly uh, true and and you might say applicable to my own immediate situation is that I you know I hear from many many young young people and from you know people of all all ages who find themselves living in a kind of feeling alienated, feeling alienated from themselves, feeling alienated from their neighbors, feeling alienated on social media, feeling that they're 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 lonely and 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 not in the midst of a kind of richly coherent uh world in which they can find and live and love uh with a kind of in a kind of harmony and be, be sort of see and be seen and to understand and be understood. And so what I'm what I'm wondering is if you uh, if you if you would say something about the you know what are the and I know it's not just architecture we'll return to speak further things about architecture in a minute but you know what what do you from your deep reflection on these questions see to be the means of fostering a shared human horizon that affirms difference while also transcending it? Well. Uh, first of all, I don't. I, I I must begin that I do not wish that uh, our um, sad experience and horrific experience here in Syria would be replicated any anywhere in the world. Although it's it's not also happening only in Syria. It's happening in Yemen. It's happening in Libya. It's happening in many parts of uh, of the region where I live. Uh, but you are right. With your concern, unfortunately, because I I, I say that explicitly in, in my book, in Building for Hope, Hope I, I say that I when I went to Europe because because I was invited, you know, after after the success of the first first book, I was invited to to to, to different parts of the world and to speak about the book in Europe and in Australia, and I was able to meet the Western audience and those concerns that you are voicing now are the same concerns that I heard from those audience members who said, well, you are speaking about your story and how your city was changing, but I can tell you it's happening here as well. And I could see that as well while while walking around in in the city. I could see how the city centers in in the major, uh, major city, European cities, how those were up for sale for for uh, the international elite and how those centers became dedicated to to tourism and to to uh, penthouse penthouses and 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 international offices and the people who used to live there are being pushed away from their own place they are further and further 
you know, moving away from the city. And this led me to, to the study that I did for the Building for Hope, that how the transformation from different modes of settlement, which, you know, the urban, the rural, and the nomadic, how those merged into one uh, homogeneous way of, of settlement, which is the re-urban, re, uh, re which is, you know, somewhere in between. It's it's not a city and it's not a village. It's some, somewhere in between. And people live in the suburbs and, and live in those continual uh, stripes of urbanism that not only segregated and not only uh, alienating, but also... Uh, you know, very lonely. People are right to fear, fear, feel lonely, and uh, it is, it is. You know, it, it, there is no, there is no joint life. There is no city life or village life. There is no uh, civic life, like like we were saying. And so, my, you said what I think could be done. Uh, I think the two elements that we encounter since you know, since one is born. Uh, is is our natural surrounding. So basically, and I have an image, by the way, I could share my screen uh, in a Please minute. Please go, go ahead, go ahead. Let me do this. Um, so let me flicker here, just, you know, to bear with me just a second. This is the countryside of Syria, and this is also that we, we were speaking now how, how the countryside is transforming. And this is an example of a, trans, a transforming uh, countryside, uh, not as in Europe. It's a different case because we have those those uh, building blocks uh, ready for tourism. So tourism in, in, our, in our case is not based in the city center. It's based in the countryside. And you could see that the countryside became urban it's not it's not a countryside and it, it it has abandoned the the vocation of agriculture and it take to, it took on uh, the, the vocation of tourism which could lead into vacant apartments most of most of the time as happening in the city center uh, european city center and here you could see the the pollution that is taking place as well um, how the water is you know polluted with petrol and 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 but the, the image I, I wanted to show you just a second this one so this is an image of children trying to find a place to 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 play in and uh, this is what I was speaking about that you know the moment a person is 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 uh, burn, uh, born, sorry, uh, form connections with, with its environment through playing and uh, through, through nature. So when it's sterile, uh, like this one, it's, it's, it's a sterile environment. There is, there is not much happening. And here the children are improvising and, you know, uh, trying to make a slide here in the irrigation canal where where water used to run. And in that sense, I, I think those children are struggling to find to find a meaning of home, trying to find a connection with their environment. Uh, and the reason why is that you have this development project behind that took on uh, what used to be a countryside or agricultural land and tr became, you know, uh, residential units, as they call it. And you have those children uh, trying to, to make sense of their built environment, trying to make sense of their home. Um, I, I think the remedy for this is just to, to, find, uh, to find the connection, you know, to establish the connection back between nature and between human and nature and human and vocation. So, and, and this is something I, I speak about in detail in Building for Hope, how vocation uh, and, you know, the, the, the different vocation reflects itself on, on the character of a place and the character of people. So it's through vocation and through nature. And unless our built environment enabled those, uh, those channels again, as it used to be, uh, we... 
I think we are doomed in, in that sense. But I mean, we we should. That's why it's very urgent to 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 find to find those connections back again. Thank you, Marwa. This this really gets at, at you know the, the the well. There's just there's so many richly beautiful questions uh, at work in your in your in your work. And one of the one of the things that you write about, I think, very powerfully is the and please correct my pronunciation, but in Old Homs, and you write the same in, as in Damascus about the souk uh, or marketplace. And yeah. not only these being beautiful uh, buildings that were capacious uh, for for all kinds of buying and selling and trading, uh, but that the very act of you know facing others and being able to express your need or your your desire for what you needed, and then to be able to meet someone else's need, you have a very beautiful way of writing about economic trade as a way of. Uh, as a as a means by which we develop a deeper moral attachment to each other because we we we're actually face to face and we get to know not only someone's particular needs but perhaps their stories we we develop trust in and through these the in and through in and through our our trading and one of the things that that I that I'm struck with again and again in your work is the way in which the the harmony that we surely all long for in our civic life is built up in and through those face to face and living beside each other and you know shopping and buying and selling and worshiping and uh, children playing you know actually with each other like it's it's not an it's not a video game it's not an abstraction we 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 come to develop shared attachments by actually being in things together and and though i'm 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 myself very uh, I, I think one has to acknowledge there's all kind of amazing uh, results of technology and of the internet and and these are these are things that have have are in, in, are kind of miracles in certain respects i think we really have to face very directly the fact that that this has also created a world in which the necessity of facing of face to face encounters has dropped precipitously and that that we we can't hope to have communities that are integrated in the way in which and i just want our listeners to know by the way because there's a question coming in in the chat which we're going to get to in, in not too long i just have a couple of other questions i want to ask marva before we move to the chat but we're going to bring those in um you know people should know that you know damascus i think may be the the settlement that is the longest continuous human settlement in the world. In any event, it's up there with with those thousands and thousands of years. There's a there's a pre-Islamic, pre-Christian. There were people living in Damascus. It, it, well, that's uh, a fact. That's a fact. It's the oldest continuously inhabited capital in the world. So there we go. So there we go. So we're talking. We're not talking. I think it's very important for our listeners to understand that you know we're we're t we're talking about a place that that for many thousands of years has been continuously inhabited uh and uh, and 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 yet here here it is with whatever 6000 years of of largely peaceful habitation as a, as a human community uh, devastated by war in all of our lifetimes like in the last 10 years we're talking about this and so what i'm uh, what i'm what i'm driving at here is a, is a, is a couple of things the, the first is that i think your work has really helped me to see that we're we're the material technological conditions of our current of the of the lives most people that I know are current you know now living you know much of it on the internet a lot of the shopping on the internet um, uh, you know particularly in the in the era of COVID in which you know many people were sheltered at at at, at home you know we're living in a, in a period of unprecedented removal from what is a historic human necessity simply to be face to face with our neighbors and th those from whom we buy and sell goods and 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 so forth and it's it's a bit like you know the problem of 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 our our telephones i've you know as some of you listeners will know that i've done a podcast not too long ago with with uh, with cal, cal newport uh who's at one of the great uh voices that that 
points the dangers points to the dangers of our being constantly connected in the ways in which these multi-billion dollar companies have divine, designed devices devices to to capture our attention in such a way that alienates ourselves from both our own inner spiritual lives and also our our uh, the people that we may be sitting with at the table while we're looking at the telephone rather than than than, than mm. speaking with them. And so Newport, you know, Newport says, listen, we are not. We did not evolve as a species to be constantly wired. This is simply not compatible with human nature, you know, in a biological or spiritual sense. And what reading your work has really made me see is that, that you know, perhaps perhaps we can find other ways of forging connections with other human beings who are different from us. But 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 we shouldn't think that the material technological conditions of our lives may not have vast consequences insofar as they alienate us from paradigmatic forms of interaction that have always, always been the basis of uh, a peaceful human community. Um, would you like to say, a, 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 you know, re reflect a bit on that, on that sort of question, which I know is just reflecting your work back to you, but if, if would, would you like to say a word or two about that before we move on to some other questions? Yeah, I mean, like you said, uh, there are certain skills that you cannot acquire through screens. We are now blessed to have this conversation via, via screen, and, and we are connected in a way that we would never have dreamt of, you know, of meeting each other uh, without technology. So this is this is an advantage that we have to acknowledge, but we should use this, of course, wisely, which which we we most of the time do not be because because like you explained, because of the shape of our of our economy and the shape of our uh, of our modern life. Now we go to the to the easiest way, but in trade, in 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 education, in uh, uh, there there. There is no replacement to the to to the face to face. So when you go into a shop, for example, in Damascus, where by the way, I I should make a quick note that Damascus hasn't been uh, destroyed by war, thankfully. So uh, it it is still the oldest continually inhabited city. It has the 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 the, the countryside of Damascus was very much devastated, but the city maintains. Uh, its uh, its status as a, as a trade capital. Uh, so, if you enter a shop, especially in Damascus, the, the tradesmen, the merchants of, of Damascus, are well known to you know to just you know have they 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 sort of have this this app <laughs> in their mind. They just you know analyze you from the moment that you are in, and they could they they could assess the character that they have with this massive expertise of seeing many faces, thousands of faces every day, and upon which they can interact and they know how to sell. And many of them, those who are, you know, still authentic and original, many of them maintain as well uh, religious moral uh, moral uh, compass. So they, they do not use those skills in order to trick you or to deceive you, rather to just, you know, to deliver to you, to just communicate with you. And this uh, this skill of communication and negotiation and trying to deliver an idea which uh, which happens in, in education and which happens in in, in trade, both uh, both are you know what makes a city a city. What, what they, they, education and, and trade, they are, they are the main, the two main activities of the city and by which cities thrive. Uh, without the face-to-face -face, uh, encounter, you, you, you lose those skills and you lose, you turn into the mode that I, that I term in, in, in the book as the factory city, which is, you know, a city that is concerned only with profit for the sake of profit. Well, I want to return to the uh, the the question of the factory city, um, but before we get there, I want to ask you, you: you write very beautifully about what it means for a city to be generous, and I'm going to read a short passage from your book, Marwa. Um, but what I want what I want our listeners perhaps to be thinking about is um, is how 
you know, if someone doesn't care for themselves, you know, there's a sense in which, you know, perhaps they've lost, they've lost a belief in themselves or they've been, you know, beaten down by circumstances or, you know, their, their sense of self-worth has been, been, been devastated. And you know, what I'm trying to say is that we all, we all know that we can feel, you know, low about ourselves and, and, mm -hmm. and discouraged or depressed or angry or hate ourselves even. Um, uh, and, you know, one of the works of uh, work of, of parents and, and of educators is, is to instill, is to, is to love people such that they know that they matter, such that they mm -hmm. can live out themselves in their own unique way in the world. Sometimes that, they do it contrary. <laughs> yes, and knowing that they have something to offer. No, and I certainly think that relative to education, I think people, and, and to our civic life, our architecture, it's really conveying the message, you don't matter. I think that's what brutalist architecture really is at its essence. Um, uh, but if one thinks about that level at which we all know what that experience is, you know, architecture in a way writ large is a way of conveying to the passerby, you know, you matter, or this is an invitation to you. Um, and, and I think when we look at, at the, the, the devastation of certain American inner cities, uh, when we think about the, the, the pandemic of loneliness, uh, even amidst the middle and upper classes, you know, we, we have very fundamental questions to ask about this very thing. And I, I want to read this passage about what a generous city is and, and ask you to comment on it. You say, when the built environment creates an experience of generosity and tenderness, freely offering fragrances, nourishment, cool breezes and shade in summer, and shelter from the rain and wind in winter. It becomes like a mother that cares for her children. You become a brother and a sister to your neighbors. This is what the old cities offered with their indigenous plants and materials in the form of an accumulated knowledge of design, the kind of knowledge that cannot be rediscovered by a single person and that is therefore always more easily lost than gained. And this is what was ruined long before the war removed the city from the face of the earth altogether. I want to ask you, Marwa, if you would comment a bit, because I think this does have to do with building for hope in a very powerful way. The second book, which we're going to turn to, to uh, speak about, not as in as much time as I would like, but um, you know, can you say a few things about the kinds of generosity you think the built environment should offer as a way of cultivating that shared sense of belonging. May I share my screen and sh show some images with, with, Please. with that? With that, with that? Of course. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So those are those are images from from homes as well. And uh, I think in the passage you touch me, you mentioned how how those uh, Free fruits. Sometimes, you know, the the water, the water. Uh, we call it sabil, which is you know a water fountain that is available for you to to drink from. Uh, and there are those those fragrances that you know you could smell them off uh, such a courtyard. So here you have people who went all the way with horticulture, and this is you know imagine this multiplied uh, on your way, on your route, when you walk through. And uh, you can see how the lemon trees are, are just, you know, dangling or, uh, on in the street, the blossom of which, you know, have this amazing fragrance in the evening. Uh, children will will just climb on and, and pick up a few fruits and, and, and go, go along. And this is another example of just you know how how blossoms and and, and you know rose trees are just dangling along, and this this shape must have you know must have must have a room for it. So if you build the building without without you know without making any room for those plants to to grow and without you know allowing uh, the houses behind to have this access to. Uh, you cannot you cannot build this culture. You cannot just instill this culture until uh, unless you have it already. And you can see how uh, 
those who lived in the old part of the city, when when we built new 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 blocks, uh, they couldn't they couldn't they couldn't let go of, of that habit. So it becomes it becomes passed from generation to the gener to, to another generation, and you you see you don't you don't notice this more and more. You don't notice this uh, in many parts of the world. So uh, in the book, I, I mentioned how I saw spikes in 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 some European cities that you know they they had installed spikes metal spikes so so the the pigeons do not come and 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 you know make the facade dirty whereas there are other places where where birds are like like here in 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 my city as well here you have you have people who are just you know put some food for for the birds on the balcony or just put some water when it's it's hot so that the birds will come and and, and have a sip and go uh, I also I also speak about an example of a tower in Saudi Arabia, for example, where it's it's a tower and you don't have a window. And and and, and the window um, when they installed new windows, the birds couldn't couldn't stand on the rim anymore. So you, you have kicked out other uh, cre other creatures from from your surroundings. So it becomes so so lonely to look at, so lonely to live in, and you lose compassion, you lose empathy, you lose you lose a lot of morals uh, on the way. Whereas when it's simple, when it's when it's uh, just you know generous, it gives you that peacefulness, it gives you that security, this uh, this uh, you know counteract this uh, the fear of need that I, uh, I speak about in, in, in the Building for Hope. One of the things that comes out so, thank you, Marwa, that comes out so beautifully in your work is this sense of human scale. And clearly, many of our cities and suburban sprawl developments uh, have completely lost any sense of human scale. I was uh, had an experience recently. I was going to visit one of my brothers in uh, who lives in Northern Virginia. And uh, we, I was flying into Charlottesville over its beautiful uh, uh, sort of uh, the foothills of the Appalachians there, very green and beautiful mount, mountain, mountainous country in the springtime. It was really a beautiful view from the sky. Uh, but I, I had an experience that uh, maybe is relevant to this. And that is that I saw down below, you know, hundreds of feet below, there was a, a house that had a uh, a, a tree-lined drive, and you know, from the air, this tree-lined drive looked absurd. It made no sense. You know, it it, it did. It was just a, a line in the in the in the in the in the land, and yet, you know, one could certainly imagine that from walking through that uh, pathway, that the experience from the from the human perspective uh, would be beautiful and shaded and symmetrical. And I think this is a really fundamental question because, you know, we don't design, you know, if we design our cities from, you know, the, from some abstract top-down plan that has, which you actually write about uh, 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 with respect to the colonial development, especially of the French, you know, actually destroying a city center or radically altering a city center that had existed for for hundreds and hundreds of years in order to conform to some central, you know, the, 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 the abstract vision of someone on a, on a computer or on a, on a chalkboard or something that, you know, what's lost in that is the fact that we actually, like, we're all human beings. we live in and through our own perspective, our own, you know, these bodies, where can we sit? What does it feel like? What does it smell? What, what is the play of shadow and, and light that our own eyes get to see? What is the, 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 what is the feeling that this space gives to me? And if our cities cannot answer that question in a way that uh, that that gives us a sense of peace and stability and 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 coherence, then they have they have failed at their most fundamental the most fundamental task of any human settlement. Um, uh, just before we go to questions, one last question for you, Marwa. About you write uh, often about the role of memory, and here you. Mm -hmm are living in in a place with with thousands of years of continuous human settlement like right where where you are and uh, and yet you also write about the the loss of attachment 
or coherent relationship with the past as one of the conditions that led to the, the recent devastation. Um, you, you, and I want to ask if you will give us this uh, uh, in its in the in the in the original which it it, it occurs, but you translate into English a, a phrase that uh, he who has no um, past has no who has no old has no new, and yeah. um, and you how does that how does that go in uh, in in Arabic? And it's and it's he who has no old has no new. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. This is a beautiful phrase. Uh, I've been done quite a bit of thinking about memory and the way in which there is no present without a past that allows us to understand what we see in the present. And you have this 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 just deeply moving metaphor in uh, in in your book in which you say that as that sense of memory was lost, you said that all Syrian communities were losing their attachments to the past as though boarding a high speed train while leaving their luggage at the station. I think there's just no question that we have all uh, in the West, you know, vastly in the last century or so, left our luggage at the station as we got on the train. Um, and, and, we leave them in the boat now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, we're going to turn to some questions here, but would you say a word about memory, Marwa? Um, uh, and And, well, let me... Perhaps let me foreground that question by asking you uh, just a, a, a question that's burning in my heart to ask you, uh, though I think I know something of the answer having read your books, but why, when millions of people were displaced and left Syria, why did you stay? A million dollar question, right? I mean, I get this question so asked so many times and uh, I'm often by the way I'm often puzzled how to respond because it's something that I felt first in my heart before I I thought of and uh, I, I, it's it's it centrally revolves around the idea of faith so the idea you know believing that your your destiny your but you know, life and death is not um, is not in your hands. So, in in our in our faith, we 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 believe that you know your time when it's when it's your time, it's your time. When it's your time, time is up. So it's it's the end, and you cannot change that. What you can change is what what do you do through that time, and that's when that's when the thinking process you know, took place for me and for my husband, that what should we do? Uh, as long as our life and death is not in our hands, uh, what should we do in the time left for us, uh, long or short? And um, we chose we, we chose to be patient about it. So, and this is also something that is also re related to faith as well, because uh, um, you can summarize faith in 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 two act, two main actions basically to be patient when it's when it's hard and to be thankful when it's when the, when the going is easy and um the process led to you know re revealing so when you stay and you be patient about it you you learn more about yourself and you you find small blessings on the way and you find uh, means of uh, of expression and means of contribution for example writing about about the subject and uh, you choose your response in, in that sense you discover your your journey and uh, in the end it becomes a very rewarding journey um, as it happens you write about how, you know, Homs is still home and the value that even though much has been lost, there are vestiges of a deeper past. And I found that so moving. I, I, I won't lie. I won't lie. I mean, I, I, I've lost so many connections with my with my city already. I was struggling with the sense of home. That's why I, I wrote the Battle from Home. I was searching for the meaning of home. And in a sense, war taught me about 
the meaning of home. But the aftermath of the conflict and 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 the loss, the, the huge moral loss and the, the many social illnesses that come out to the surface that, you know, frustrates you and exhausts you. And uh, I won't lie. I mean, I, 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 I struggle to find those connections, but I, I'm convinced that that I uh, I have something to do about it, to do about it, and it's the best place that I could begin with. You know, I, I can. People search for meaning for their lives by you know finding meaningful channels for their contribution, and I I think that we are here as long as we permit it. Uh, we have the perfect channel for contribution because there is no other place that needs us more than our place. So beautifully said, Marwa. Uh, that's a an invocation and a exhortation, I think, to to all of us. I'm going to turn to some questions here. Uh, Christopher asks, and and please understand that some of these are huge questions, and I know they can't be easily answered in a second or two. But you know, say whatever you you like in response. Christopher asks, what are the Islamic inspirations for architectural designs? Uh, well, I don't think it's it's uh, a formative inspiration. I think, uh, in terms of you know, in terms of Islamic architecture, it revolves around. Uh, Islamic thought, and uh, as as any as any other religious architecture or, or any other expression of, of thought. So we, when you when you are immersed in a certain idea, or when you are you you have you know you have your thought re revolving around uh, certain concepts, that must you know they become the vehicle for your expression, and uh, I think art. Uh, does that uh, just that because you know whatever is happening you know this this uh, this interaction between the mind and the and the heart and and what you feel and what you think about and your priorities and how you look at the universe and how you look at yourself uh, you find the manifestation of this in whatever you do and you see it in craft you see it in 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 in, in so many works of art uh, and in architecture as well. Well, to follow up with that question, I mean that that in a way begs another question, which is, you know, what are the what are the ideas, uh, the ideas or principles in Islam that are embodied in architecture? And you write about this at at at, at, at various points in your 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 your, your book, uh, and also at, at, at comparing them with ideas in Christian architecture, which you suggest in many respects are very similar ideas differently expressed. But you know, there's another questioner here who says, which is perhaps you can answer this question uh, by continuing uh, your answer to the last question. What are the moral imperatives? And we might add uh, uh, theological or social imperatives that relate most directly to architecture. Moral imperatives? Yeah, what, it, what are the ideas that I guess the question is, what are the ideas that architecture can express and foster in the world positively? I mean, these are really hard questions, but I will try my best. Uh, I, I think I think in continuation to the, to the first uh, question, it's, it's not about symbolism. It's not about creating metaphors. It's, it's about something that, you know, what you believe is, is uh, you know, it's, it's something that you do not pretend as an agenda, as prior agenda, because it's something that, like I said, it's something that is, um, uh, revolves around your understanding of your own nature and the nature around you. And in, in that leads to the, to the moral imperative question, which is, um, for example, justice is, is one of, the major concepts that is is um, is we 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 very much overlook or you know take take lightly, although it's it's very difficult to to achieve because everything as I as I see it is in in life revolves around finding balance. So just to find the right balance is is, is a huge task. You know, just to, to know how to make something just just right. 
it's, it's something that takes an enormous amount of skill and enormous amount of understanding of uh, uh, of those moral imperatives. So, like we spoke about generosity and, and justice and doing no harm, for example, in the book I speak about the the, the street strikes, where where you know where the public space should not invade the private space and the private space should not you know take on take over uh, sorry the, the public space. Finding this balance, this you know. Keeping this tension interesting and also resolving conflict is just you know it, it's an enormous task and it's something that you don't have like uh, you don't have an agenda for it. It's just you know um, you believe in 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 main concepts like like justice and and, and, and generosity and, and 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 rights and you take on from that and. I should add that, you know, also the perfection of all striving for perfection, because nobody is able to achieve perfection is a huge part in 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 the Islamic culture, I think. It's just, you know, uh, you see it in, in the way the craftsmen and the tradesmen do their work, because it's it's an act of, it's, it's sort of act of worship. So you do the best you can with your energy whatever is uh, are you, your capabilities and you pour that into an act of love and in in that sense it's it's looked at as if it's it's an act of worship yes one of the widespread misconceptions you address in the battle for home is that is the idea that religion was the cause of the conflict when in fact you you show you know very beautifully that in fact it was the 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 work of religion in the city to, in fact, uh, establish that shared horizon to speak up to protect the vulnerable and the downtrodden to to articulate a transcendent sense of justice uh, and to bring the individual into that sense. And you write about how architecture, at its best, in these in the architecture of worship, perhaps especially locates the individual in relation to the whole and the part in relation to the whole. And, you know, it seems to me, Marwa, that, you know, it's completely fine if people want today to think that, um, you know, they can, that we can live without, we can live without religion, but they have to face the fact that, uh, that you cannot have a shared human community with certain forms of practice and understanding that establish precisely that shared horizon. And that is what the works, of, the work of the great religions have have done. They have been the spiritual highways through which human beings have been conducted through through all of human history. And we we either need to find ways, those of us who don't have those practices, of rediscovering those practices, or or else we're left with having to invent other forms of doing the work that religion has historically undertaken. Um, uh, but we shouldn't think uh, for a second that we can somehow, it's like the uh, what you were saying about the marketplace, that we can somehow live without the forms of, of human activity that have precisely brought us into an awareness of uh, transcendent realities. Um, I'll move on to a number of other questions here. Someone asks, Marwa, uh, thanking you very much for your discussion and asking how can we better understand architecture or specifically understand the effect it can have on societies, especially for people who don't know a lot about architecture, where can we begin? Well, I think in every human being, there is an architect living down there waiting to emerge because, uh, and Although it's 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 um, it's a skill and it's a training uh, that you know um, at its highest level, it's it just you know you cannot uh, you cannot uh, imitate or you cannot you know uh, illuminate sometimes. Uh, but all of us are capable of understanding architecture because all of us are capable. Who of us, you know, do not uh, arrange their home or just, you know, create create special corners in home or, you know, find this more beautiful or, you know, adjusting one painting in, in, in some place on the wall. So 
those are act, act of architecture and uh, and everyone can understand architecture and everyone can although in different degrees you know, of course and this is the 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 the, the goal of such conversations that as the one we are having but also we are all uh, affected by architecture that's why it's so important because when we we walk in streets we we, we live in and around architecture you cannot accept you cannot escape uh, uh, the built environment you, it, it's 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 where we live and where we work and that's why it's very important that every one of us uh, think and contemplate about their surroundings and it's merely by opening your eyes and just reflecting just you know um listening so i i, I sometimes say that you know i'm reading the, the building or i'm listening to the building uh, as any work of art i think that's so important to ask the question you know how does this make me feel and why and of course, there are wonderful books one can read. I would myself recommend both of, of Dr. El, Marwa El Sabuni's books. Um, I know she would recommend the work of Sir Roger Scruton, who uh, is actually through Sir Roger that I that I came to know of Marwa. Uh, Sir, Sir Roger wrote the the foreword to the to the Battle for Home, and um, I, I know he has a wonderful book that I've actually just uh, uh, ordered a copy of called The Aesthetics of Architecture which I know Dr. El Sabuni knows. Um, so of course, there are lots of things out there that can be a beginning point for, for learning. Um, someone asked Marwa uh, what you make of, uh, the question is, in the United States and elsewhere too, over the past three decades, there have been a variety of initiatives to re-engage civic dynamics in, an architect in architectural settings. The goal is to summon back the notions of village and neighborhood that earlier generations experienced. To be sure, segregation and its ugliness have always existed, but I wonder if you have any contact with the so-called new urbanist movements among architects and historians and urban planning professionals and citizens more broadly. Having lived for three years in Beirut, 2007 to 2010, I learned something, but not enough, about the challenges of civic restoration. How would you compare Homs and Beirut, vastly different though the two are? Well, two questions I... in there, obviously. Yeah, I, I write about Beirut in, in Building for Hope, and uh, uh, I confess that I am not a fan of the Lebanese experience because it embodies um, all the the bad choices that we must avoid in, in, in rebuilding a city. And uh, so it's, it's not comparable because uh, I think Beirut is... is because it went through the the process of reconstruction, whereas we haven't yet. So it was destroyed by civil war, but then it, it was it was uh, reconstructed uh, in a very uh, in in the worst way actually that can be because it it revolved around uh, perpetuating uh, the 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 feud that is in the city and in the country and uh, it is it revolves around you know uh, this mo this modernization for the sake of modernization just for the sake of you know following following the steps of the west and and uh, it's so exclusive and it's very difficult to walk through and it's a city that you know has failed its own citizens it's, it has been evacuated from from its own citizens who migrated to to every corner of the earth and so the Lebanese Lebanese experience is 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 a very unfortunate one. Uh, so what was the other part of about the new urbanism? No, I haven't been in touch. Over. I don't know them. Okay, but I, I will look them up. Um, we have a number of other questions here. Uh, Jesse, this happens to be uh, my brother, Jesse, I see the last name is Blackwood here, asks, have you seen the documentary Return to Homs? If so, what did you think? He says it's one of his favorite documentaries. Well, I live in Homs, so I don't have to watch documentaries about it. So, no, unfortunately, I, I, I haven't. Uh, so, I don't know what to say. I haven't, I haven't seen it. Um, 
Uh, Brian says, greetings, Marwa from Ireland. I met you at your lecture and book signing in Dunloyer, my for former hometown. Alexander's last book was called The Battle for the Life and Beauty of the Earth, a struggle between two world systems. He called these systems world system A and world system B. It's a description of the construction of his project, the Aishin Campus, in Japan, uh, do you know his work? I know, of course, that you know his work, but would you like to say a few words about uh, Christopher Alexander? Yeah, I, I think Christopher Alexander is a, does a, an amazing work, and in, in sometimes I think uh, uh, he is he's mis misunderstood because he is labeled as an academic, whereas I think his his uh, his his work is so applicable and, and he had, he has done something, you know, uh, like you said, he built project and he built houses. And uh, uh, I quote the, the system A and B in, in building for hope. So uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's very good, uh, very good example to highlight. And I, I, I must say hi to, to, to Ireland and the Irish people, because it was, you know, one of the, the, the most beautiful experiences I, I had outside of my country because it's, it's such a welcoming uh, people and, and such a welcoming country. Um, Marwa, another question uh, James has written to ask, uh, what it, this is a very simple and difficult question. What exactly is a home? Well, I think I wrote two books <laughs> about <laughs> about the subject, and um, it's yeah, it, it is difficult to to summarize, but uh, I will endeavor uh, either way. I uh, I think a home as a form is something completely different from one individual to the other, so it cannot be one form to to, to any to anyone in specific. Whereas as a concept, uh, as something that you could you could not construct it's just you know it's something that you can cultivate and end up building i think i think it's it's something uh, that could be broken down into into feelings and into uh, systems which i do in building for hope thank you another question what should one be aware of when thinking about the relation of architecture to childhood? Um, I think we, we just uh, touched upon this very quickly with, with the picture of the children that I showed. It, I think the, the, the concept of home and the feeling of home is, is, uh, is formulated in those early years. So whatever that is our context and our surroundings, we 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 form this mix of memories you know visual memories and and feelings uh, of finding and striving to find safety and stability uh, in those early years and we carry that conception with all its you know tangible and intangible aspects with us so you know you remember sense from your childhood and you unconsciously or consciously and you, there are colors and scents and 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 scales and, and forms and faces of course and sounds all of this you know uh, physical experience uh, is uh, is imprinted in in the early years and i i should highlight here and bring to focus the 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 experience of the the refugee children, the Syrian refugee children in in camps, which I cannot imagine how how deformative this experience for them, and and how unfortunate, and how we should as as a world we shouldn't allow such such you know atrocities. It's a. Uh very sobering to think about the children growing up in the midst of war and in refugee camps um, who no one deserves to be in such a situation, but uh, surely for children above all to be denied 
to, to their childhood to be forced to be in a place of such inhuman um, circumstances is a tragedy beyond Linus, yeah. beyond words. Um, um, just a couple of more questions before we conclude, uh, Marwa. Though the past century has been marked by unprecedented prosperity, uh, why have so many of the buildings constructed since the Second World War been so ugly? <laughs> Well, that's the question of, uh, of building for hope, isn't it? I mean, it's it's the factory, uh, what I call the factory city. I think it's uh, the short answer in one word. It's greed, and and the 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 focus of uh, of the aftermath was about quantity in, in the you know versus quality, and I think those who profited profited and usually profit in the aftermath you know wanted to, to expand uh, their profits uh, uh, using those uh, concepts like modernization and globalization and so on so opening new markets after the war is just was was i think was was the was uh, the reason why we had uh, we had what we have today and yet at the same time i mean one thing that i'm really struck by is that often, I mean, sometimes people make the argument that fundamentally, you know, the ugliness is a consequence of the, of the market. And yet, uh, the reason I think that argument is problematic is because so often when, you know, cost is absolutely no object at all, whether it's maybe it's a museum or, or a, 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 an expensive building in a, in a very wealthy city, uh, they are often, they are often the ugliest of all. And so it seems to me that there's an ideological role there as well. Sorry, I, I think the main focus was the transformation of the building material. So oh, I you see. had, yeah, you had a new market created for the building material that was intended to be uh, to to build quickly and on, on a large scale. But then you know you had no breaks on on that process, and you the process ex excluded those locations that we spoke about you know those those um, building uh, skills that were were related to traditional building materials that people used for thousands of years but then you had the, the cement and iron and 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 so on and so forth uh, and the building industry had this is the change between you know you had a craft as an architectural craft then you had building industry and you had this shift uh, that excluded a whole range of vocations that were involved in, in building. Now we see some exper experiences that reintroducing those those you know those those vocations those tradesmen back into into the process. But unless we we supported those you know those endeavors and those initiatives, um, I think that the takeover of of uh, mass industry is, is just so so risky and alarming and the product is ugly like simply ugly it, it's it's a very interesting thing that that though i think it's important not to be too romanticist about these questions it's very interesting that many young people are finding themselves you know alienated and without a place uh without uh, a purpose and yet and that and that this seems to this seems surely to be connected to uh, uh, to a loss of relationship with historic forms of making, historic forms of living, historic forms of production, historic forms of uh, belief and self understanding, uh, tradition. It seems to me these things can can simply not be 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 disconnected. Um, I think the five years here may be handy because you know you can look at those uh, products you know, from from through the lens of the five years, and you, you may have you know a conclusion. Why would would someone describe it as ugly or or as alienating or as uh, or as you know um, mean or uh, attacking sometimes?
Yes, I think that's 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 uh, that's that's beautifully beautifully said. Um, I'm going to read a, a very moving passage from your book, Marwa, towards our sort of concluding our conversation, um, uh, just to to give people a, a sense of the um, the the very rich uh, and uh, deeply moving. Uh, character of, of your writing if, if, if those have not yet read it, because I want us to conclude here with a, a little bit of conversation about uh, what we do from here, what each of our responsibilities is. And you, you give us a very beautiful image of someone who has not given up hope despite immense suffering in these last pages of your book. You give a, a series of, of, of images of people fighting through the immense struggle post uh, war and you say yes all around us we find the people who inspire us with the examples they set a man who witnessed his brother burned to death due to a mortar shell and lay beside him on the pavement while drips of flaming fuel burned his own head and hands watching the stunned street looking back at him and waiting for a neighbor to come to smother his flaming body with their own with those burnt hands, he still paints walls with a smile on his face. Such people, and there are many, help us to dream of a country that we can call home again. These people are surviving on the very little that was left for them of the small businesses, spiritual beliefs, mutilated urban and social fabric. It is worn out, yes, but still it struggles to survive because good people give it life from their own precious fund. And you continue, if anything can be learned from this pointless war, it is that our solutions should spring from our own depths. I find it difficult to read those words without getting emotional. They're so, the, the scale of suffering and yet the, the persistence of hope amidst that is so moving. Um, and I think it's it speaks to all of us, no matter where we are or what we are facing or where we are living or what homes we are in or what communities we are in, that there is both a responsibility, but also a beautiful opportunity to persist and seek to build a truer, a happier, more meaningful homes for ourselves and for others. And so Marwa, I want to uh, give the last words here to you and to uh, ask for, ask you for any final reflections you have uh, on your, your own life and situation or on advice that you may be willing to offer to each of us listening uh, around the world about how we can foster and build um, better homes. Well, you made it a bit difficult for me because it, I mean, thank you so much for being so compassionate about it. Uh, I, I think I think it's, it's, it's our duty to, to each one of us to battle for their home and to defend their homes. And if you, if you don't find it in yourself, you know, you don't find the sense of home, that's, that's because, you know, it's not your fault. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's because you, you couldn't, you couldn't find those connections with your built environment. And it's our duty to make those surroundings better, whether we were architects or whether we were, you know, citizens who just, you know, different from different vocations, from different walks of life. We have to make those choices and we have, you know, in the West, you have channels to, to voice your opinions. You have communities and societies that defend what is uh, deemed as right and what is, you know, deemed as beautiful. And with, with, and you have so many good examples of, of, uh, uh, opening also channels for discussion and finding finding you know means of reconciliation between between different ideas, which is threatened as I as I hear and, and, and see uh, in the media is being threatened in the West currently. I I, I think you uh, should defend that, and we in our region also should find means to find those those channels, although it's very difficult for us as also as I speak in the book is because we we are still in this region we are still captivated with 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 the post-colonial 
era and we have so many issues to deal with. Uh, and I just, you know, uh, I just pray and hope that we will we will find peace in all over the world, especially in our region as as in, in its current situation. Uh, and it's our job to collaborate and to 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 find ways of keeping the conversation uh, alive among between us and uh, and you know when it's when the moment comes to to rebuilding this part of the world it's, it's very important that all of us be aware of which kind of what kind of building will take place because it's 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 probably most probably that you know the west will be involved in 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 rebuilding uh, this part of the world because it's it's part of part of the business i think and it's it's very important that uh, that the channels you have and the platforms you have be be you know had had their eyes had their eyes wide open on that on that process because you are able to voice those uh, those concerns in a more um, collaborative way and more organized and ordered way than than we do because we have those structures eroded long time ago Um, you should unmute yourself, Stephen. I'm sorry, I can't hear Ex you. Excellent advice. Thank you very much, Marwa. It's uh, I I I hate even concluding conversations like this. There's there's such a well of uh, human wisdom and um, empathy that we all in what you say that uh, I would just like to continue um, uh, uh, going back to. And on that note, I must say that it's a great honor to uh, to to welcome you and to have you as a as a new fellow of Ralston College. And I hope we'll have opportunity to hear from you often over the the year over the years uh, years ahead. Um, well, the honor is all mine, and I very much look forward to to this collaboration. Well, in, in conclusion, I'll simply say, Marwa, that uh, I just thank you for for your example. The example of your humility and courage and deep human understanding that illuminates and helps us all better understand these urgent questions, the civic alienation and aesthetic degradation that are facing uh, so many of us. Uh, but you you show you show a way forward that is uh, uh, filled with hope and inspires uh, hope in me. So I thank I thank you and I encourage everyone to. To, uh, to track down both of your books and to read them as soon as possible. Thank you for sharing with us today from Ham Syria. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for the opportunity and thank you to everybody who, who listened to us.